Let's, let's take questions as we go. Yeah. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this session of uh, Linux ConfAU. Our next presenter is Matthew Wilcox from Microsoft, and he will be talking to us about NVM Express. Please make him feel welcome. Thanks, everybody. Um, yes, my name is Matthew Wilcox, and I work for Microsoft. Um, the, what I'm going to talk about, I worked on while I was at Intel. And uh, I was so busy working on NVM Express that I actually missed two LCAs. I missed LCA 20, 2012 and 2013 um, because I was just so busy with NVM Express. I wasn't doing anything publicly that was Linux related and nothing I could talk about anyway. Um, nevertheless, I don't regret it. Well, I do regret it. I regret not coming to every single LCA. But um, this, this, this was one of the, the highlights of my career and uh, I'll, I'll explain that as I go. The, the theme of this year, of course, is a little bit of history repeating, so I'm, I'm going to delve into the history of hard drives just a little bit, not quite to the uh, same thorough extent that Benno did yesterday. Um, this, this is only hard drive standards from my lifetime. I'm not going back to the 1950s. <laughs> yes, I'm not talking about them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the history a little bit, but I don't want to bore you too much with that because you want to know about stuff that's relevant today and uh, hopefully stuff that's relevant in the future. So uh, I'm going to as far as NBM Express explaining where it came from. And I'm going to talk about persistent memory and explain why I think that's different and we're not going to see history repeating with persistent memory. So this is an example of an ST506 system. It's not actually an ST506 drive. There was a drive in 1980 called the ST506, and it gave its name to generations of hard drives after it. Um, ST506 was not just, became the name of the standard, um, which was just what somebody happened to do back in 1980. This is actually a mini scribe 8425, uh, I think from about 1983. But uh, you can see there's a controller card, and you can see there's a hard drive. And so um, the, the, the card, it's an ISA card, um, had a, a register interface. Um, the, the CPU would, would talk to the registers, and then the card would do some kind of funky DMA in order to transfer the data from the card to the hard drive. <clears throat> and that was, that was succeeded by IDE, um, Integrated Drive Electronics. And it was called IDE because it integrated that card we saw in the first disk, uh, on the first slide into the hard drive that we saw on the other side. So all of a sudden, we had reduced our components by one, and you just plugged this IDE connector into the motherboard. And the reason that this worked was that that is actually an ISA bus. It may not look, look like an ISA bus, but the, uh, electrically, those are the very same signals that travel down the cables as are coming out of those slots there. Now, IDE was retroactively named to ATA, AT attachment, referring to the original IBM AT. And then later it was rena renamed to Parallel ATA once we got to Serial ATA because we wanted to distinguish between the two. Now, Serial ATA, again, an evolution, we retained the command set that was used on ATA, but we had a controller again because this... Um, the, the, the cable was no, longer, um, <laughs> was no longer an ISA bus, thankfully. It was, it was now a 1.5 gigabit uh, serial link. Um, so we had to have a controller again, because at the time there was nothing on the PC side that was a 1.5 gigabit bus. That changed, of course. Um, but yeah, now, now we have a controller again. So that controller has its own um, interface specification. It's got its own set of registers. And <laughs> what, what, what we ended up seeing um, was actually a, a wide variety of controllers. If you go and look in the Linux kernel directories in uh, drivers slash ATA, you'll see an awful lot of different controller files because a lot of people came up with their different definitions. The most common, of course, was AHCI. And uh, the, the lady on the left there, Amber Huffman, uh, was the, um, the author of the spec um, for, for AHCI. So she, she ran the industry association that was responsible for defining how the vast majority of us talk to our hard drives. Um, the lady on the right is uh, Nisha Talagala, and uh, she, she, she was the lady who got me into uh, working on NVM Express in the first place, although it wasn't called NVM Express at the time. 
You see, NVM Express came from a merger between uh, NVM HCI. Now, the NVM HCI spec was derived from the AHCI spec. Um, AHCI was generally implemented on a PCI Express device or a pseudo PCI Express device that was actually just part of the, uh, what was then called the South Bridge. Um, the, the NVM HCI spec, which was published in 2008, uh, does not change the AHCI programming model substantially. A little bit. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the same standard, but it was deliberately designed to be um, very uh, compatible. Now, when, when we started what, what, what we called the Aeon project, um, we had identified the bottlenecks in AHCI and thus also NVM HCI. And that was that we did four register reads per I.O. Uh, the cost of a register read is about 700 nanoseconds, and you're doing four of them for each I.O., so that is 2.8 milliseconds. Sorry, microseconds. At 2.8 microseconds, you are not doing a very large number of IOs per second. And uh, if, if, you, if you've paid attention to what an NVM Express drive can do, um, you, you know that we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, sorry, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of IOs per second. And that's kind of hard to do when you're taking uh, you know, that, 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 that length of time per IO. So the Aeon project, which was started by Nisha, um, was heavily influenced by RDMA and InfiniBand. This was the, uh, the background that she came from. She, she'd been working on InfiniBand uh, while she was at Sun, and then she moved to Intel and uh, continued to promote this kind of technology. And her idea, the, the foundation of the, uh, the Aeon project, was that we were going to expose storage directly to user space. We, we, we weren't going to trap into the kernel to do IOs, because going into the kernel is really slow. OK, good. Bit of laughter there. Good. Um, so the kernel was involved in the setup, but the IO was done entirely in user space. Um, there were also some other really, really interesting um, uh, features that it had beyond just the regular sort of block read, block write command. But I'm not going to talk about those because I think some of those actually have value and they're still part of, uh, th th those are things Intel has not disclosed and I don't think it's my place to disclose them. Um, the concept of doing I.O. directly from user space is really not a uh, particularly innovative thing to think about. Uh, so I think I'm on pretty, pretty safe grounds. Um, also, Intel now ships an NVM Express driver in user space for the purpose of doing this kind of thing. So we've kind of come full circle on that. So that's another little bit of history repeating. Um, so Nisha came to me one day, well, she sent me an email, and said, uh, hey, um, we're building this system. Um, I got your name from someone. Are you interested in helping out? I said, sure. I, I, I love help, helping people build stuff. I love doing good things for my company. Um, so we, 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 we put together a small team, there were four of us, who uh, built a prototype, well, a prototyping system. Uh, she came to us with a specification that was, um, it was very grand. It, 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 it looked squarely at the stars and said, this is where we're going. And it had no detail about how we were going to get there which is the perfect situation to throw someone like me into, because I, I, I know where you want to go, and I've got some great ideas about how to get there, and um, if, if, if you don't want to constrain me by telling me how we're going to get there, I'm happy to build a system for you. Um, so, we, so, so we put together this system, which was um, two x86 systems connected via a, non, a PCI Express non-transparent bridge. So this, the way a non-transparent bridge works is that each machine will see the other as a device. So we, we, we randomly said, this one's the host, this one's the adapter. There's, there's, there's really no difference between them, but we had to just pick one, so we did. And uh, we configured that non-transparent bridge so that the adapter machine could access the entirety of, of the host machine's memory, whereas the host could only see one page of adapter memory. So from the host's point of view, it thinks it's talking to a PCI Express device. And you can write your driver that way, you know, accessing this other machine's page of RAM, thinking those, those are actual PCI Express registers. Um, but, on, but on the adapter side, it knows. The, the, adapt, the adapter knows it's faking everything. Um, so 
rather than um, you know, a, a, a right necessary triggering direct action, which you would have with a real uh, piece of hardware, um, the adapter system polls these registers. It, it would just go and read all of these registers looking to see if anything had changed since the last time it had looked at the register. So it, it was um, horribly inefficient. I have no idea how many, how many uh, joule, megajoules of energy we must have burned doing this, but yeah, it was only one system. It's, it's not like we have had a fleet of a million machines all doing this. Um, obviously, for <laughs> this is, yeah, it's just a prototype. Um, and while the non-transparent bridge we were using did have DMA controllers in it, um, they, they, they were buggy. Um, this was not an Intel non-transparent bridge. I'm, I'm not going to tell you the name of the vendor because it doesn't matter, you know, it, it's ancient history at this point. But um, yeah, the, the things you do to try and make stuff work, we, we were just using memcopy on the CPU to simulate DMA. Um, we, we, we did all kinds of crazy things just to get this, get this stuff working and demonstrate the possibilities. And we did demonstrate the possibilities. Uh, we got 1.8 million IOPS out of this system. Uh, we, the, 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 the latency was just ridiculously low um, because we were writing directly to DRAM. I mean, we, we, we did not try and do we didn't try and simulate the latencies of NAND. That wasn't part of our remit. Our, our, our goal was to build the most efficient interface that we could think of and was also implementable by hardware. I'll get to that in a bit. So we had great fun doing this. Um, so we designed I.O. commands. Um, we, 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 we took a page from the, the networking folks and uh, we, we, we have uh, submission and completion queues. Uh, again, this is also uh, InfiniBand terminology. So uh, the, the, the <laughs> I'm seeing some nodding from the people who are familiar with InfiniBand. Um, it turns out they're not actually queues, they're, they're circular buffers. And I, I really should have gone and consulted the computer science literature before I named these things. But yeah, what's done is done. And we have doorbells. So the, the, the way that you do this thing, the way you submit a command, is that you write it into your, your queue, which is based in host memory. And then you ring a doorbell by doing a 16-bit write to uh, the adapter and say, uh, hey, the, 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 there's a new command for you at, at, at this index. And uh, the adapter comes across, picks up, the, picks up the command out of the queue, executes it, and then writes a submission entry uh, into the queue. Now I said, that's not the right way to do it. Reads are slow, writes are fast, because you don't, you don't the way that PCI Express works is that writes um, not cached, but they are, they're, 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 you, don't, you don't wait for them. Whereas if you're doing read, you start the read, and then the CPU has to wait for the read to come all the way across the PCI, PCI Express bus. Well, in our case, actually, two PCI Express buses because it's got to hop from the CPU's memory to the non-transparent bridge, and then again on. So I said, no, no, no. Let's put the submission queue in the adapter's memory. And the, hard and the hardware architect I was working with at the time, uh, Mark Schmisser, said, no, um, we can't do that. That's no, not, not not having that. Those are going in. Uh, th those are going in host memory. We can't afford the uh, the RAM on the adapter to do that. I said, okay, you're the hardware architect. I I I can't argue with about the design of the hardware. Um, of course, NVMe Express fixed this later, um, and Linux now has support for doing submission queues the way that I said it should have been, been done in the first place. So, I went uh, eventually. <laughs> Um, and the format of entries on the queue evolved over time. We actually started out with a 16-byte um, submission queue entry. And when you think about the fact that um, you're using eight bytes of that to represent the, um, the, the address that you're writing to, because you want to address blocks in a, you want a 64-bit block address, um, that, that, that's really pretty tight. And it was actually far too tight. Um, so we ended up going to 32 bytes, and then we actually ran out of room again in 32 bytes. So we ended up growing to the 64-byte um, submission queue entry that we have today. I know there are people chafing at that and wanting to have 128-byte entries, um, but they're wrong because 64 bytes is the size of a cache line, and it's really, really important to squeeze things into a single cache line because cache line writes are 
If you, if you write an entire cache line at a, at a time, that's way more efficient than writing you know, little dribs and drabs here and there. So we got the I.O. commands done, and that was great. That was awesome. That was so much fun. Um, and then you have to do all the boring stuff about, like, how do you set up a queue? Um, because you know, just, just getting stuff to go faster isn't good enough. You actually need to be able to manage this stuff when you get it. And, and when you're prototyping, you, know, you just hard code everything. Oh, I'm going to set it up with eight queues, and I'm just going to write into all the queues, and I know exactly where they are, because this is my system, there's one of it, and uh, I know where everything is. But in, in, in real life, people are going to plug your card into all kinds of different systems, and they're all going to have different uh, layouts. And you, you, you've got to discover things. You, you can't just go off and say, I know where everything is. But for, for prototyping, you do just hard code stuff. So <laughs> literally, somebody said to me, how are we going to discover all this? And I came up with the admin queue. So it looks an awful lot like the, uh, the I.O. queues, um, but there's, on there's only one of them, and um, it helps you set up all the other queues. And it, you can do various different things. And it's, it's funny, you know, some, some of these things I put in, like the abort command, and not a single implementation, as far as I'm aware, has ever implemented the abort command. I tried. It, it, it was going to be good. Yeah. Hardware people. Um, so yeah, this is the system we were actually building. Um, propriety to Intel this, 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 this sort of concept where you have a RAID control with four drives behind a controller. <clears throat> um, and uh, if, 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 you, if you look back to the slide that I, I put up earlier, um, Nisha's team was building the controller, and Amber's team was building the drive. Um, and that's because Intel reports its results broken out by business unit. And Amber's group is, the, is, is now called the uh, non-volatile memory group. And Nisha's group is called the data center group. And the way that this works internally to Intel is that um, if Intel sells you um, some storage, then the NVM group gets credited for selling you the storage. And if they sell you some data center hardware, like a Xeon, um, then the data center group gets credited for that. You may be asking what happens if Intel sells you a data center drive? And this may explain some of the conflicts we had during the course of the project. So we, 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 we shot this design around to some customers. And not all of the feedback was positive. Some of it was. I mean, so, some of the customers really, really, really enjoyed what we were doing and said, oh, yeah, we can totally see a use for that. And they said, but we're not really keen on a single source, particularly if it's Intel. I mean, if, if we're buying a PCI, PCI Express card from some little startup, we can bully them. Right, then, but on the other hand, if you're buying something from Intel, the power relationship's a little bit different. So it's much better from our point of view not to get entangled in the first place. So we're just going to say no to buying this product from you. The, the, the user space programming model didn't help either. I mean, some, some customers very enthusiastic, the, sort, the kind of customers who are willing to rewrite their entire code, restructure their entire code, they loved it. And I, I think some of you work for those kinds of companies who, in order to shave off a, a microsecond of performance, well, actually, it was about six microseconds of performance per I.O., absolutely, this, this will make us billions of dollars. It will totally repay our investment. And then you have some more traditional companies with perhaps a 10 million line code base. And they're saying, I, I can't see a use for this. I, I, I really can't change my application to work in the way that you think. You really are going to have to come up with a kernel-based programming model. And I think the real nail in the coffin of the Aeon project was that uh, Intel was set to release um, two PCI Express cards, doing, both doing storage, with completely incompatible programming interfaces. Companies were already pretty unhappy with, at, at the time, and this is a few years ago, we had uh, Fusion I.O. with their completely proprietary 
program interface. Uh, we had um, LSI with theirs. We had two or three other companies, each with their own slightly different uh, programming interface about how to attach uh, NAND to a PCI Express bus. As we were saying, look, we want to have multiple sources of our NVM card, of, of, our, of our, our, our NAND PCI Express cards, but we don't want to have different drivers for each of them because qualifying drivers is a nightmare. Getting um, Mm, commercial Linux distro with a driver updated for all three of them. Most companies want three sources for their, uh, for their cards. It's just a nightmare. What, what we want is a standard. We want everybody to be implementing the same standard. And Intel listened. So the NVM HCI workgroup already existed. They had already produced that spec back in 2008. And I don't want to say the Aeon team took over the spec, but the result of the spec, um, the, the resulting spec has far more in common with Aeon than it does with NVMHCI from, from a programming model point of view. Now, what the NVMHCI workgroup had that was valuable was credibility. Um, it had membership from basically all the major players in the, uh, in, in the NVM ecosystem. Um, so uh, Micron were there, Samsung were there. Um, the, the list of NVMe uh, workgroup members is, is, is public. It's up on the list. But, and and so, some of them joined afterwards. Um, but it, it, it really is a who's who of the, uh, the, the, the NAND manufacturing industry and operating system vendors and um, other random, uh, ASIC vendors, um, lot, lots and lots of people who were involved in, in NAND wanted to be part of this work group because this was where the, the spec was being defined. <clears throat> so we had to change a lot of things um, in order to turn it into, uh, in, in order to turn Aeon into NVM Express. Um, our submission queue entries were specialized to do user space IO. Um, so we had to completely redesign the submission queue entries. Uh, we had to um, add registers. <laughs> because, it's, because this had all come from my prototype, and we hadn't really gone back and done a full architectural review of, of my prototype before starting to produce silicon. Um, <clears throat> well, produce is the wrong word, uh, design. We were designing silicon. Um, I don't think we ever fabbed anything. Uh, we, we, we produced some ASICs for sure. Um, we, we, we added some registers at the beginning to make it actually look like a standard rather than something I'd hacked up in my basement, which is basically what happened. Um, so, 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 so things like, well, if, if, if you read register zero, that's going to give you the string NVMe, so you know you're actually talking to an NVMe device. Um, if you, in order to configure the administration queue, which I'd never quite got around. So the administration queue is used to configure all the other queues. I had not quite got around to making the admin queue itself configurable. So they, 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 they fixed that for me. Um, and a bunch of other early setup, uh, th th things like handling um, interrupts before you have uh, message signaled interrupts set up, or, or, or that kind of thing. I mean, we, 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 it took months. It probably took years. Um, but it, it, it really did t change into a much better for specification. And then finally, towards the end of this, it was like, we need a better name than NVMHCI, because NVMHCI is, is, is a really crummy name. And um, it, again, it took months, because when you're choosing a, a name for a standard, you have to go off and buy the domain name. You have to do, do a search for other confusingly named products in the past. And you wouldn't believe how many um, storage NAND, NVM, so when, 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 you, when you put all the different bits of it together, how, how many variations you can generate and how many of them have already been taken by somebody else. Um, and we ended up with NVM Express, and I'm so happy. I, I, I really love NVMe as an acronym. Uh, NVM Express, uh, uh, you know, it implies PCI Express. There's actually nothing really PCI Express specific about this. You could put this on other kinds of buses, um, but it was designed to be. Um, 
on, on, on PCI Express. <laughs> the other thing I had to do was, start, was, was, was get us a kernel driver. I had been so focused on this whole user space I.O. thing that uh, the, the kernel driver that we had really just set up the queues. And it just let, uh, it, it let user space start poking at hardware in, in a somewhat safe manner. Um, remember I was telling you that the, uh, the, the, the queues are in um, host DRAM, so basically it's mapped the, 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 the memory that was being used for the, uh, for, 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 for the submission queues and the completion queues into uh, your application. And uh, also the doorbells. The doorbells could also be mapped into your application. So you could just write your commands into the queues and ring the doorbell, and everything was great. Well, all of a sudden, we needed a block driver. Uh, and that was initially done by uh, Shaoua uh, Li, who is now at Fusion, which is um, somewhat ironic. Um, we had a secret fork of the driver. We, 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 we were somewhat. The, the, the driver was released to other members of the work group as the specification was going along because obviously we had certain uh, confidentiality. You know, when you, when you join a work group like this, you, um, you, you, you sign various agreements. You know, we, we won't assert patents against each other, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to keep everything confidential until the first version of the spec is officially released and so on and so on and so on. Um, so we, we, we were sh uh, I, I was doing drops of the driver to other members of the work group, um, but I still had a secret fork that I was very careful not to let outside uh, so, so that we could continue to make queues available to user space because at this point we still had dreams of actually um, continuing to support the, the user space I.O. Uh, even while at the same time uh, having, having this, this, this block driver as our primary motivation. Um, so as, as, as development of the spec continued, I continued to modify the driver so that I was, I was trying uh, both, both the driver and the adapter in order to stay in tune with the spec. And uh, one, one of the mistakes we made was not growing the prototyping team because I was basically the only person reading the spec, uh, writing, the, writing the adapter side and writing the, the kernel side. And um, I made mistakes, can you believe it? Um, it, it would have been enormously helpful to have, a, have had a second person who was doing either the kernel side or doing the adapter side so that we were arguing with each other about what, what the correct interpretation of the spec was and uh, making sure the spec was clear um, because if, if, if two people read the spec and get a different answer from each other and they don't interoperate, then clearly the spec is unclear and needs to be fixed. But through all this, um, we, we managed to release the Linux driver the same day as the spec. And I'm, I'm, I'm extremely proud of that, that the, the we were able to, work, I mean, this, this means that Linux was the first operating system to support NVM Express. Go us. <laughs> oh, thank you. I was, I was just expecting some cheers. I wasn't expecting applause. That's, 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 that's very gratifying. Thank you. Um, so we, you know, it, it, that first version didn't actually get applied as is. So we, we went through a few iterations on some of the things that I'd done. And uh, by now, the driver is, is mostly rewritten. There's very little of my original code left. Um, and and I, 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 I passed on maintainership of the, uh, of the driver to, um, uh, to, to Keith and Jens. And I think Christoph as well has a lot of his code in it. Um, but nevertheless, I, 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 was, I was quite happy about that. And the first bullet on this slide is actually the, what, what I consider to be the, uh, the highlight of my career so far. We killed serial ATA. Yeah, like that's big. Um, there, there was a 12 gigabit stand. So SATA, you remember at the beginning, I said it was one and a half gigabit. It doubled to three gigabit. And then it doubled again to six gigabit. And they're working on 12 gigabit. And they, they said, there's no point. We're going to stop because uh, most of the people who were working on 12 gigabit serial ATA were also working on NVM Express, and so they 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 could see that NVM Express was um, faster than serial ATA was going to be. Um, you don't need 12 gigabit serial ATA for traditional hard drives. Uh, three three gigabit is plenty. Um, some uh, one, one, one of the motivations was for uh, what they call expanders. So you, 
you run a, uh, a, a, a lead, for a, a cable from your computer to an enclosure, and then you have a number of drives in the enclosure. And they said, never mind, we'll, we'll use SAS for that. Most people are using SAS for that anyway. Um, we're just going to give up on 12 gigabit SATA. Now, SATA is not entirely dead yet. You can still buy motherboards with SATA. You still have SATA connectors coming off your south bridge. But stopping development is, 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 is the first step towards, towards death. Um, you, you can't buy a, a motherboard with parallel ATA anymore. I know I tried. Uh, <laughs> I've got, I've, got, I've, I've got a dead motherboard, and I've got nothing to plug that hard drive into. Um, anyway, so we, we, we came out with the, uh, this, this, this now wasn't me. I, 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 I had moved on at this point, but my, my colleagues came up with what's called the SFF8639 form factor, and that's a two and a half inch drive form factor. Um, the, the, so so you, you can plug um, a whole bunch of these drives into uh, an enclosure, like people do with uh, SAS hard drives. Um, the, 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 the shocking surprise to me actually is the M2 form factor. And those are those teeny tiny little cards, they're like this big, and um, they're in basically every laptop that I'm willing to buy at this point. And I, I, I've even seen, in fact it's quite common now for ATX motherboards to have even two M2 form factor slots on them um, in order to support having multiple NVMe Express drives. And, and, and this is success beyond my wildest dreams. When, when we were working on NVMe Express, we were thinking about um, the, the, the data center. We were thinking about um, you know, these half height, if not full height, PCI Express cards that you plugged into a slot, slot and were you know, by, by, by four or by eight connectors on them. We, we weren't thinking about M2 connectors, but this is where the industry went. The industry just decided, SATA's dead, we're going to the M2 form factor and we're going to put PCI Express on it because the, the M2 form factor has um, PCI Express links. Um, PCI Express comes in a number of, different, uh, number of different form factors these days, which is just awesome. Um, one, one of the other consequences was that PCI Express hot plug became more relevant, that um, uh, hot plugging a PCI Express card was something people did very rarely, but it turns out with storage people like to hot unplug drives all the time. And so a number of operating systems, a number of BIOSes, um, a number of platforms had some bugs in their PCI Express uh, hot plug support because it just wasn't well tested. And all of a sudden people started caring. The other big consequence in the ecosystem is that uh, SCSI over PCI started, um, was released as a standard, and never adopted. Strong work. Um, we got a bunch of stuff wrong. Um, we defined our error codes. I, I, I really regret doing that. We should have just used SCSI's error codes because now we've got a, an, another set of error codes that we have to have conversions into, well, frankly, um, EIO, um, and occasionally ENO space. That was stupid of us. We, we should have just used SCSI's. Uh, we, 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 we fixed the problem that we hadn't actually defined scatter lists properly. We, 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 we defined this thing called a PRP, which lets you, which supports a single page, uh, sorry, a, a, a single contiguous range of pages, because I was told that was what we needed. And then some file systems decide to submit random 512 byte IOs, which are scattered all over memory, but are contiguous on disk. And so what you really want to be able to do is say, you know, a few bytes from here, a few bytes from there, da, 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 put them all together in one place on the disk. I, I didn't realize we needed that. So that, 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 was, my, that was my fault. Unfortunately, we were able to fix that in 1.1. Um, we used 64-bit registers, and I got um, chewed out by an Intel CPU architect for that. Oops. 64-bit um, writes are really expensive, it turns out, because you need a 64-bit data path instead of a 32-bit data path. And it was stupid, because the only thing we actually had the 64-bit registers for was configuring the, the admin queue's address before it was activated. So there was no need for speed. There was no need for atomicity. It was just, uh, we, we have a 64-bit quantity. Let's do a 64-bit write. Stupid, wrong me. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. Somebody put some the, the reservation commands in, into the I/O command set instead of the admin queue ad, admin command set. Oops. Um, we 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 had some. Yeah. Oh, the the last one. I'm not even going to try and pronounce because if you do try and pronounce it, you'll be violating the code of conduct. So don't do that. We should have controlled. It, it does mean controller ID. I swear. It mean. The, the 
the worst thing? That was actually added by a woman. She just wasn't thinking. Who, who reads acronyms out loud? Australians. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> um, so I think persistent memory is going to be different. Persistent memory is not block-based. We are not going to see, in my humble opinion, um, the, this, 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 this rotation from, okay, we've integrated more stuff onto the controller, now we're going to put another controller, we've sort of integrated more stuff onto the drive, now we're going to put a controller in front of it. We'll integrate that controller onto the drive, we'll put another controller in front of it. I don't think we're going to, we're going to see that with persistent memory. Um, because from a software point of view, there isn't a command. There's no command set. It's just a load and a store. Um, the kernel can get involved. You know, we, we, we can, if, 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 if there's a, a problem with writes, we can, we can map it into user space read only. If there's a problem with reads as well as writes, we, 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 can, we can tell user space it's got this persistent memory mapped in and take a page fault for every single load and store or, or put a page of DRAM in and, and write that whole page of DRAM back when it calls an msync. <sighs> Please don't put, I'm, I really, really hope the, the hardware folks don't put bugs in, but this has not been a good month for that point of view. It's really nice to be able to fix hardware bugs in software. And of, of course, the hardware people don't intend to put these bugs in, but it does feel like it at times. Um, <laughs> yes. So one, one, one of the big reasons that you put a controller in front of things is so that you can use distributed storage. Uh, and, and here's a whole bunch of uh, networking uh, protocols to get used, you know, fiber channel, iSCSI, ATA over Ethernet, uh, NVM over fabrics, which is a specification I wish did not exist. I don't think we actually needed it. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I lost interest and backed away from the uh, work group at that point. Um, what I think we'll see is RDMA. We're going to see remote DMA from machine A to storage appliance B because there is still, you still want a NAS, you still want, you, sorry, you still, you still want a SAN. I, I don't think there's actually much scope for a home-based NAS, but you, but you do want a storage area network. If, if you are running a data center, you want to have storage, 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 compute, 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 and you want to be able to mix and match and slice and dice and have this access that and so on. And, and one of the big criticisms of the whole, um, uh, the, the whole project of persistent memory is this is local to your computer. I can't use that in my data center because I need to be able to rip and replace. And, and using uh, RDMA is, 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 I think, the solution to this. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, NVMe is the most optimum uh, block storage mechanism we were able to devise. Um, if, I think if somebody comes up with a more optimum I.O. mechanism, we should probably start adopting it. But until that point, if you have a controller that's, that's not RDMA, that, that's, that's, give, that's presenting you with a block-based interface, have a PCI Express device which implements NVMe and then converts those NVMe commands into whatever format it takes to get the data to where it's going. Because it's just so much more efficient than anything else anyone's, anyone's come up with. The virtualization people have a bit of a problem with this, but they're wrong. Um, <laughs> And I have a minute to go. I want to remind you that Microsoft loves Linux, and I want to thank them for sending me here. Um, and I have one minute left for questions. Anyone? Shout it, I'll repeat. No. You actually have a few minutes more than that if you want to. Oh, oh that's right, I have an extra five minutes. Great, excellent. Um, OK, please wait for the mic. <laughs> um, hang on, I think we've got one coming back here. Thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I especially liked your slide with the design mistakes, which I guess are inevitable. Um, yeah, there you go. Do you think that, and I mean this in a, in a nice way, do you think that perhaps releasing the controller source and all of that stuff early so that other people can be involved in these things in a very open design process might, open design process might help improve these things? Plus we'd get access to the source inside these random microcontrollers which everyone distrusts and that there are attacks for. Okay, so I, I, think, I think there's, two, there's, there's sort of two points there. 
Um, one is NVM Express is a, is a standard. Um, and releasing standards to the public at maybe a 0.9 level while there's still time to fix bugs before anybody starts to uh, develop hardware, I, I think would be a great thing. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can see that there's a lot of companies still very wedded to doing things the old way. And there is the patent landmine problem. That if, if, if somebody says, oh, hey, you should do things this way that I just happen to have a patent on, and they haven't signed the work group agreement, then that's, that, that's going to lead to problems for everybody involved in the work group. So I don't, I, I think we would need a regulatory change before we can get to that level of openness. Um, your, 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 your second question, is, I, I think, is really why, why, why don't we have a more open implementation of these things? And I think there is actually an NVMe implementation on open cores. Um, and if there isn't, there should be, and, and uh, somebody should do that. Uh, not me, I'm not a hardware guy. But I'm happy to talk to anyone who does want to do that, um, because the more NVM Express that's used in the world, the happier I am. Um, I think where you'll run into trouble is getting all the NAND data sheets that you need in order to um, efficiently talk to NAND. Uh, Firstly, I'd like to say you can actually get home-based NAS boxes. They're quite often sold as backup package, parts of backup packages. Uh, sorry, I, I meant you, you, you're not likely to get persistent memory-based oh. NAS boxes. I don't think there's much of a market for that. Okay. And secondly, does NVMe come with some sort of cabling standard like SATA does? Or is there, there, there are multiple connector standards for uh, NVMe. So there's the M2 form factor, there's uh, SFF 8639, and of course there's just a regular PCI Express, you know, half height, full height, half length, full length card, you know, whatever you, you want. And they all come with their interestingly different power budgets. Um, and uh, your, the speed of your NVMe Express device will generally depend most on the amount of power it's allowed to consume. Did you end up getting uh, user land queues into the Linux driver? Did I get what in? User land queue. User land queues. User land queues are not in the Linux driver. Um, they would not be useful at this point uh, because there are the we, we never published the specification for what a submission queue entry should look like for a user space command, and it would be unethical of me to. Uh, submit a patch at this point for that kind of thing because Intel would own that work and uh, I, I, I would probably get into to some trouble because that, that was work that uh, they own. Um, yeah. Hello, yes, thank you. Uh, earlier you commented on uh, NVMF uh, over Fabrics and it not necessarily being necessary. Can you speak more to that and what you would <laughs> recommend instead? Uh, thank you for inviting myself, me to get in more trouble than I um, already am. Um, <laughs> no, no, I, I, I will comment. I just didn't want to get into a rant. Um, it, 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 is, it is my position that there's actually nothing wrong with iSCSI. I think that the people who, who wanted to do NVM over fabrics uh, really should have been implementing an NVM Express device that instead of having any NAND on board, had Ethernet connectors and doing the protocol conversion between NVMe and iSCSI. I don't blame the work group for, for, for working on NVM over fabrics because there were at least three different vendors who were absolutely convinced that this was the right way to go. And they were going to each come up with their own protocol for transmitting uh, NVM command, NVMe commands over the network. And so if the working group didn't standardize it, we were going to be faced with a Tower of Babel situation. So it was, it was the right thing for the committee to do, but it's the wrong thing to exist, in my opinion. It doesn't need to exist. And one last question. Hi. Do we need to worry about side channel attacks? <laughs> yes, always. We always need to worry about side channel attacks. And with that bombshell, um, <laughs> please thank uh, Matthew Wilcox. Thank you, for appreciation. thank you so much. And that is our final session for today. Um, there will be the uh, professional delegate networking session at the at six thirty at the. Uh,
I've forgotten the name of the place. It's the function center, the aerial function center. That was it. In building 10, uh, there will be the unprofessional delegate networking session downstairs at the same time. And uh, we will see all you lovely people tomorrow. Thank you very much.